Hey everybody, welcome back as we talk about a requested subject here, sentence diagramming. Today in this video we'll cover basic sentence diagramming and I tell you what, why, sentence, why diagram sentences? It's a great tool, it's an important tool and I use it a lot. Why? Because it makes my life easy when it comes to grammar and understanding is my sentence, you know, is it, is it correct or not? Is it grammatical or do I have errors? Because it provides a visual blueprint of the sentence. You know, imagine if you would try to mentally juggle, without a blueprint now, plans for building even something as simple as a birdhouse. Someone just trying to describe it to you and say, well, we'll have two, ga um, two gable ends. Those will be the front and back of the birdhouse, uh, where they'll have a 45 degree angle starting about six inches up, heading towards a peak at the center. Notice I'm even helping with my hands. What if I didn't use those? It'd be worse. But, you know, it's difficult to follow. We talk about the sides and how we'll bevel the sides so the roof can come down over smoothly without creating an air gap. And, oh, it gets crazy. Same thing can happen in a sentence. You try to describe, okay, what's the antecedent of this pronoun and try to remember that. Uh, to try to remember what's the direct and indirect objects in a sentence. That when it's just a flow of words on one sheet of paper, no kind of indicators of what each are doing. That gets hard to do. So you do a lot of mental juggling in order to remember the roles and relationships of all the words in the sentence. This shows it visually. In a sentence diagram, you visually get the roles and, and relationships. You get to see in one shot how all those parts function together in the sentence. You look at it like looking at a blueprint, it all makes sense. Oh yeah, you see how the parts fit together. And it's a lot of fun. Besides making it easy, we don't have to juggle mentally, it's fun, frankly, if you like word puzzles, Sudoku, or those kind of things. I think you'll have a lot of fun with it. It's kind of like something to, to figure out. And so let's get right into it. Why, why don't we? No more advertising. Let's just see how we do it. Okay, basic sentence diagramming starts with the foundation, and that is the baseline. This is the baseline. And the bisector on the baseline, that line, the vertical line that goes up and down through the horizontal line, separates the key components, the heart of any sentence, or any clause for that matter, a subject and a verb. So that's the heart of a sentence. Every sentence has to have a subject and a verb. They go on the baseline. Subject to the left of the vertical line, the bisector that crosses it, and the verb to the right. Nouns and verbs go on the solid horizontal line, including you can also have uh, subject complements and verb complements. Verb complements like direct objects, which you go behind a solid uh, straight up line that doesn't bisect, just goes up. Or you may have predicate adjectives or predicate nominatives going behind a diagonal line. And we'll talk more about that later. Uh, I shouldn't draw that because you'll think it's a line. Either of those things. Behind a diagonal line that points back to the subject, we'll talk more about that later. But our modifiers, and this is the key point here, modifiers go beneath the words they modify. So let me get those extra lines out of there and talk about the modifiers. Things like adjectives describing nouns like in this case a subject would go on a diagonal line beneath the word they modify. Same thing with adverbs on a diagonal line beneath the word they modify. So those are the basics. Let's try it on some examples and see if we can make it work well for us. All right. Here are some simple examples. We'll start with just a subject verb sentence. No fancy stuff. Subject and verb with a couple of minor modifiers. The little boy played. Very simple. What's the subject? The little boy. Well, let's boil it down to the one noun that is the subject. Isn't that one noun boy? Very good. And what did the boy do? The boy played. That is the verb. So there you have the very kernel, the very heart of that sentence. Boy played. Now we do have some modifiers, don't we? We've got a determiner a type of an adjective describing this noun, boy, the. Which boy? The boy. And we've got another simple adjective, little. Which boy? The boy. Which boy? Little boy. The little boy. So you can see we've taken care of each of the words in there. We've checked them off. They're all accounted for and this diagram shows how they work together. The subject drives the verb and we have two modifiers telling us more about the subject. Okay, let's go forward and try some other things. Let's try a subject verb sentence with some complements. Now, we'll try both verb complements and, and subject complements. 
Start with a verb complement. And here's a sentence. The little boy played ball. And we've added a few more modifiers. Well, yesterday. So, the little boy played. That can stay the same, right? But we're adding an object. Played what? Played ball. So I put another vertical line to separate out the verb and its object. A boy played what? Played ball. This is a direct object. And direct objects occur on the baseline after the verb passed a vertical line, straight up and down. And we also added a couple more modifiers here, didn't we? How he played. We have two adverbs now in there. He played what? He played well. An adverb of manner. How he did it. And we also have another adverb, an adverb of time. When did he do it? Time modifies action. That's a point, by the way, I keep making um, when talking with folks about, amber, about the grammar. Anytime you have something talking about when, or just let's, let's leave it right there. Talking about when. When something happened. Notice what I said, happened. It's related to an action. When things have to do with time never modify nouns, they modify actions. You don't noun when, you act when. You verb when. So that's important. So yesterday is one of those adverbs of time. It was when this happened. When the playing happened. And there we have the sentence. The little boy played well yesterday. But of course you also have the direct object and we actually would insert it in between there and say the little boy played ball well yesterday. Because adverbs can float in a sentence in English. Um, in um, when we use adject ad adjectives, they need to be right next to the noun. But adverbs can float in our language. Not true of every language, but in our language they can. So we've done one with modifiers, subject, verb, object with modifiers. Let's do a subject, verb, predicate, nominative, also with modifiers. The little boy is my brother. So we're talking still about the little boy, but different situation about the little boy. It's not what he does, it's what he is. Now the verb to be is a what kind of verb? That's right, a linking verb, probably the most obvious and prominent one. Little boy is, it's kind of like an equal sign, right? Joining the boy to yet another, either another name for it that equals it, or some attribute that we say describes it. So it's either equal or similar to, that would be the description, to use some mathematical terms. Let's try with the equal first. That is another name for it, a predicate nominative. The little boy is what? Is my brother. Well, what's the basic noun there? Is brother, right? And this time we separate it from the linking verb, not with a vertical line, but a diagonal line that slants back toward the subject, kind of reminding us, hey, this thing is another name for the subject. If that helps you, you can think of that with that line. So the boy is brother. Whose brother? Which brother? You got it, my brother. So we have an adjective modifying brother, so it goes on a, a, a diagonal line underneath the word it modifies. So, the little boy is my brother. Very nice. Well, that's one way to have a, a complement with a linking verb. We can have a, an absolute equivalent where it is a predicate nominative, but we said we can also use the predicate as a place to mention more information, an adjective, about the subject. Let's do that next. The boy is very tired. So the boy is what? is tired. Now, the boy isn't equal to tired, but the boy is similar to tired. That is, it describes him. So this is a predicate adjective, correct? Predicate adjective there. The boy is tired. We're not saying he is a thing called tired, like we did a minute ago when he said he is a thing called brother, my brother. It's not an equal, but again we use this diagonal line pointing back because it's still giving us more information about the subject. Not information about another name for it or what it is, but information about what it is like. So when you have linking verbs like is, or for that matter, seems like, those sort of things, appears, they're going to be tied to a predicate adjective with more information. And this predicate adjective is itself modified by an adverb, right? Because if you modify an adjective, you must be an adverb. Very. So, the little boy is tired. How tired? Very tired. 
The little boy is very tired. So there we have a predicate nominative and a predicate adjective in the two examples using the linking verb to be. And we also covered a straight up transitive verb. We call it a verb that acts on another thing that takes an object. We had a transitive verb with an object. In that case, played. Let's take a look at a few more examples and dig a little bit deeper, shall we? Let me slide that down there. Let's talk about conjunctions and compound subjects and verbs. You know, if I say, like in this sentence here, John and I like candy, that sure is a lot handier than saying, John likes candy, I like candy. You sound like a robot when you talk that way. So many times, rather than having two simple, separate, single subject, single verb sentences, we say, you know, hey, I'm going to say John likes candy as well as the fact that I like candy. Why don't I say it all in one sentence? So we have two subjects. How do we show that? Well, we expand our diagram out to create a bracket that gives room for the two subjects. John is one. I am the other subject. What do we do? We like something. And that something we like, we like what? That has to be a direct object. Whenever you can say a verb, what and get an answer back in your head, that's the direct object. We like candy. So as before, we use a vertical line straight up and down to separate the verb from the direct object. Okay? But John and I are joined with the word, I just said it, and. And that goes on a dotted line connecting the two parts of the bracket. So John and I like candy. That's our first simple, let me erase that bottom bar there, our first simple sentence that has a compound subject. Well, what if we also don't want to say, John and I like candy, John and I like cookies? What if we want to say, John and I like candy and cookies? Our second example where we have a compound object. Well, we do the same thing here. We create room on that baseline by expanding into a bracket. We leave our vertical line that tells us whatever's over here is a direct object, but now we've got a couple of direct objects. We like what? We like cookies. And we like candy. And again, we'll use and along that dotted line as the connecting conjunction. So conjunctions, because they join, will be put on a dotted line joining whatever it is they're joining. In this case, compound subjects, compound objects. Well, nouns. Well, we've done nouns, subjects, objects. What if we want to say you know, uh, we do more than one thing at a time. Like, in this sentence here, I eat, drink, and breathe basketball. We didn't want to say, I eat basketball, I drink basketball, I breathe basketball. We just want to get it done in one sentence. By the way, you know anybody like that who likes to eat, drink, and breathe basketball? You know, we just had finally the um, NCAA tournament finish up just a week or two ago, and you'd run into people who sure acted like that. But let's see how we would do that. We're back to a simple subject, so I can get rid of this, and I can just put I here. That's my new simple subject. But the rest of it is going to expand out, because I have not just one verb, but three verbs, eat, drink, and breathe. So I need three lines on my brackets here, where I can place my verbs, eat, I eat, I drink, and I breathe. They'll be connected once again with a conjunction on the dotted line. That conjunction is and. Hope you can read the and there. I eat, drink, and breathe. What? Well, we've got to bring them back together for the answer to what. Because there isn't, each doesn't have their own direct object. They all have one shared direct object. What is that? We all these things to basketball. We eat it, we drink it, we breathe it. So basketball is our direct object. It's a single direct object, though, not compound. So we have single verb, a single subject, compound verb, single direct object. Let's try one more, where we have compound modifiers. Don't we say, boy, you know, I'm hungry and tired, or in this case, he runs quickly and quietly. Well, let's start over with our sentence and see how that would look. Can you think about how that might look? Are you starting to get an idea? Well, let's start with the baseline. He does what? He runs. 
How does he run? He runs quickly. How else does he run? He runs quietly. Those two we could say in separate sentences, he runs quickly. He runs quietly. quietly. But if we're going to put it in one sentence, we'll almost certainly join them with the word and. So he runs quickly and quietly. And, and my apologies, that's a little bit small. But you heard me narrate as I put it across there. So I think you probably caught it. He runs quickly and quietly. This is not that clear. Let me clear that up a little bit. He runs quickly and quietly. Compound modifiers. So I think you can see there's some basics that we use in simple one clause sentences. How we use uh, complements, whether they're verb complements or subject complements, how we sh make them show up. Those would be direct objects, predicate nominatives, predicate adjectives. We showed how to make things compound or singular, and we also showed how modifiers fit in, how they go on the uh, horizontal lines beneath the words they modify. So we use that as a foundation. Start with that with simple sentences. There'll be other videos uh, where you can check out how to diagram more complex parts of speech like phrases and even clauses coming up.